Hi, welcome to session 10 of History 3375, CIA in the Third World. Now, in the last session, we talked about Vietnam, and I briefly want to reiterate a couple of things that I was sort of hurrying through at the end. One has to do with causation in terms of looking at motivation for the U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Uh, if you, we look at it from the perspective that we've used up to now, talking about economic and strategic and ideological motivations, uh, it's pretty clear that economic motivations had little or nothing to do with it since Vietnam had no real significance for the United States economically or really for the world economy in general. Um, ideologically, yes, we could certainly say this was the fight against communism, uh, although it seemed to carry on long beyond the time when the United States really faced a credible threat from the Soviet Union. And as for strategic concerns, there was concern with the fate of Southeast Asia. But I think with that case in particular, we have to start looking at the broader issue of all of these factors combined. In other words, that the overriding motivation for the United States in these interventions is the attempt by the United States in the second half of the 20th century to essentially cast the world in its own vision and to create a world order uh, that at least imitated, if not identified with, the U.S. model of capitalist development, liberal democratic institutions, and generally an openness to penetration by American culture and American values. Those societies which challenged that larger vision, whether it was on the economic front, the ideological front, were likely to find themselves the target of intervention. And certainly that was the case in Vietnam with the rise of Ho Chi Minh and the threat of the communists, at least, to take complete control over Vietnam. And it is that larger concern that we have to remain aware of as we finish up this last set of cases over the next couple of weeks. But I think Vietnam is one that brings that out in particular clarity. At the same time, of course, Vietnam caused a significant change in one of the conditions that affected the outcome of interventions, and that is conditions in the United States. When the war is completely over for the United States by 1975, the old Cold War consensus has collapsed. There is deep division over U.S. foreign policy within the United States, and that condition will remain with us right down to the present day. The case we're going to look at today begins while the war is really in full force in the United States. And at the same time, however, the CIA has not been so adversely affected by the outcome of the war, because the war doesn't end until 75, the case we're talking about ends in 73. The CIA is not so adversely affected at that time that it is unable to function effectively. What does happen is the CIA is able to continue operating in a clandestine manner, largely free of interference from Congress at this point, but as we also saw when we talked about the history of the CIA, Congress will quickly be investigating the CIA, and this is one of the cases that congressional investigators will be particularly concerned about that was being carried on at the same time that the Nixon administration uh, was fighting the war in Vietnam. And the case we're talking about today, of course, is Chile. Now, if we go to the first slide uh, to look at a historical background uh, in Chile, uh, this small country on the west coast of South America is distinctive from most other countries in Latin America uh, in its historical background because of the high degree of stability that Chile enjoyed throughout the 19th and at least the first three quarters of the 20th century. Compared to other Latin American countries at this time, there was political stability and relative economic prosperity during most of this period. There are a variety of reasons why that was true. One was the statesman Diego Portales, a leading Chilean political figure who helped create a system that was at least semi-authoritarian in its form. In other words, a powerful government with few limits on that power that helped maintain stability in the society. Another factor uh, was the reality that Chile's elite was relatively compact. They were referred to as the 400 families, families that had intermarried, that shared common economic interests, and that intermingling of these elite families, again, helped provide another basis for political stability. A further factor was the uh, Chilean constitution, which essentially 
brought into legal form the kind of government that Portales had created. Uh, essentially, the Constitution allowed the president to exercise rights under a decree of a state of emergency that were dictatorial powers. So all the president had to do was declare a state of emergency, and he essentially made himself dictator uh, over the country. So that while there are elections on a regular basis, the fact is the president has enormous power. We'll see a little bit more of that later on. But the Constitution, which gave such overwhelming power to the executive, was a further reason why stability could be maintained over a lengthy period. Now, reflective of that was presidential succession, and that each president who served in Chile during the 19th century, up until the 1890s, served his full term of office, and then was replaced by another constitutionally elected president. So that succession was an indicator of just how stable the country was compared to the histories of many other Latin American countries, especially in the 19th century. In addition, Chile enjoyed economic prosperity through much of the 19th century. It was known as a major exporter of wheat and copper into the world market, and those products helped feed a fairly prosperous economy during much of this period. A key to the success of Chile at this time was a cheap labor force. Tens of thousands of Chileans, known as rotos, people who were the basic working elements of the population, migrated throughout the year. Chile is a long country, several thousand miles in length. And the rotos would migrate through the country, serving as migrant labor, particularly on agricultural estates, but also working in mining operations. Complementing that group of laborers were also Another group uh, called inquilinos, what it means is renters, people who rented small pieces of land on the great estates and in return provided labor for the large agricultural estates. So between the migrant labor, the rotos, and the inquilinos, the land renters, there was a large population available that could be employed at very low wages to produce the material wealth of the country. So this exploitation of labor became a key to success for Chile during the early decades of the 19th century. Over time, however, it also became a burden because of the inexpensiveness of labor. Mine owners and estate owners made little effort to improve efficiency. In other words, new machinery, using fertilizer and agriculture, because a way of increasing production was simply to use more labor, which was relatively cheap. The problem with this is as other sources of these raw materials began to develop, the American Midwest, copper discoveries in Africa and in Europe, as cheaper producers came online, Chile's international economy began to suffer severely by the 1870s because it could not compete at the price levels that were being set by more efficient producers of these products. A solution that the Chilean elite found in 1879 was to go to war. Chile in 1879, in what was called the War of the Pacific, went to war with its two northern neighbors, Peru and Bolivia. Out of that war, Chile seized a large desert area, which constituted about a third of Chile's territory once it was incorporated into the nation's borders. Now, you might wonder why a nation would go to war to seize a large desert region. Because that desert region contained nitrates, a basic chemical used in making fertilizer and explosives, although the main use of it is in the use in fertilizer for agricultural purposes. These were the only commercially exploitable nitrate beds in the world. They were enormous inexpensive source of the basic ingredient for fertilizer that was being used throughout Europe, the United States, other parts of South America, and elsewhere. So Chile had this natural monopoly on a product, and it meant that suddenly an enormous amount of wealth was going to flow into the country. Now, 
the nitrate industry is not run by Chileans. British investors in particular had dominated the industry when it was controlled by Peru and to a lesser degree by Bolivia. So when the Chileans seize the nitrate region, they leave the British and other European investors in place and simply impose a tax on the export of nitrate. And that tax is what will bring much wealth into the country. Indeed, the government became one of the major engines of economic growth. Up until this time, the government's main purpose was to maintain stability. And an army would go out, crush uprisings, deal with political difficulties. The government carried out minimal activities in the economic sector. But now, a huge amount of wealth is flowing into government coffers because of the nitrate tax. And that tax is being redistributed to members of the elite. For example, the government is arranging for low-cost, in fact, negative interest loans to landowners. If you own a large estate, you can borrow money, and you'll actually pay back less than you borrowed. Bankers receive the tax revenues, are not required to pay the government interest, and then can loan that money out for business purposes. It's the ideal situation. Normally, a banker gets a deposit. They have to pay you interest on the deposit while they're loaning it to someone else. Not in this case. As a result, banks could make a tidy profit on the nitrate revenues deposited with them. Merchants are benefiting from the fact that the nitrate region is growing. Thousands of people are moving there to work in the nitrate plants. And it is creating a large internal market for agricultural products and for other goods that Chilean merchants can ship to the north. So all these groups seem to be benefiting from this new wealth created when Chile seizes the nitrate region. Overseeing the latter stages of this process in the late 1880s uh, was the elected president of Chile, a man named Jose Manuel Balmaceda. Now, Balmaceda was a typical member of the elite and related to past presidents. He seemed to fit the model of a typical Chilean president, and there seemed every reason to assume that the same stability which had marked Chile's history up until this time would continue into the future, and certainly during Balmaceda's presidency. However, that was not to be the case. Instead, a major conflict broke out between the president and Congress. Now, the political issue at hand, as defined by politicians at the time, had to do with the powers of the presidency. Congress was arguing that the president was exceeding his authority, that he had too much power. The president, in turn, denounced Congress and said, well, what you people are trying to do is to create a parliamentary system to undermine the authority of the president and put power in the hands of Congress. That's not what the Constitution is about. So we have this political debate going on between the two sides. But underneath it was a larger debate. And it is this, that under the Constitution and under the way the system had worked up until this time, the Chilean president did have enormous power. He had, for example, an absolute veto. If Congress passed a bill and sent it to the president and he didn't like it, he would veto it. And that veto was it. You can't override the veto. Now, Congress can come back next year and pass the same bill, and the president, if he wants, can veto it again, and it's dead again. So if the president was opposed to something, that was it. It just wouldn't happen. The president also had enormous authority over the dispensation of government revenues. And this is what the crux of the argument was about. Complaints by members of the elite that Balmaceda was not distributing the wealth of the state equitably. In the past, of course, the government didn't have a lot of money. So this was not a major point of debate. But now the government, since the conquest of the nitrate regions, is very rich. Maybe the most important economic sector in the country at this time is the state. And one man essentially has control over it. And there is a sense that he is not equitably distributing that wealth among the leading families of the country. 
This is the fundamental argument that underlay the debate over politics. And it is this which leads to a split between the President and the Congress and brings on civil war in 1891. A civil war not between two sections of the country or two ethnic groups, but a civil war between the President on the one hand and Congress on the other. Congress wins the civil war. Balmaceda will commit suicide. And with him ends this tradition of a powerful presidency. Although the basic governmental institutions appear to remain the same, in fact, what Chile now has after 1891 is a parliamentary system. You still have a Congress, you still have a president, but the way the government now works is that the president must have a cabinet which enjoys the support of a majority of Congress. Otherwise, nothing will get done. As a result, presidents cobble together, because there are multiple political parties, more than half a dozen, they cobble together a cabinet which represents a majority of Congress. The way the system works, practically speaking, because there are many cabinet changes over time, is that the government is now working to distribute the wealth of the country among the elite. If three parties form the cabinet this year, their groups tend to get most of the money because their people control the ministries. Next year, two or three other parties control the cabinet and they funnel the money to their people. So you have this sort of uh, political system that is functioning almost like a corporation with stockholders and the elite are essentially the stockholders and they're distributing the dividends to themselves. This was also a period when not a lot got done by the government. The government was not into taking great initiatives. There were mounting problems in the country, particularly concerns about workers and peasants and their poverty, but little was being done to deal with them. In fact, the reaction to their protests was rather negative. 1907, the nitrate workers, and there were tens of thousands of these people in the nitrate desert, went on strike. They were upset about pay, about miserable working conditions. The government's response was to send the army up to the nitrate region and attack the strikers at a schoolhouse in the city of Iquique. The schoolhouse was called Santa Maria. And kill at least a thousand of the workers. They simply machine gun them and then dump their bodies in the desert. That was their response. That if workers go on strike, our answer is we shoot them. So it's not a very positive or creative environment. The elite simply feels that they're going to repress any protests or stirrings from people at the bottom. Now, this system might have persisted for God knows how long, but problems had arisen by the time of the First World War. Specifically, European countries, especially Germany during World War I, developed methods for producing synthetic nitrates, nitrates manufactured in plants. Therefore, Chilean nitrates suddenly faced intense competition, particularly after 1919, because synthetic nitrates could be produced as cheaply or cheaper than Chilean materials. So the nitrate industry by the 1920s is starting to run into trouble and suffer severe setbacks. Those economic blows are coming and falling upon a population in the North, there are some 60,000 workers in the North, that already feels that it is in a desperate condition. Most nitrate workers were brought up to the nitrate pampa, or the nitrate desert region, uh, through a system called enganche. It's essentially a form of debt labor. You're working somewhere in the countryside in Chile, someone offers you an advance of money, five pesos, if you come and work in the nitrate region. Then when you get up there, you have to work off your debt, and you discover that you spend most of your time working off the debt and don't make very much money. So most people felt as though that they were really in a form of indentured servitude in working in the nitrate region. That and miserable working conditions 
where temperatures in the desert region easily exceeded 100 degrees every day, and temperatures in the nitrate plants easily exceeded 120. On top of this, there was anger at foreigners, especially the British, because it was the British, British investors, who controlled many of the large nitrate plants. So there was anger over working conditions and anger over the foreigners who control this industry. It's not surprising, then, that it is here in the north where communism gets a strong start among these workers. And this will become the heart, the initial starting place of the Communist Party in Chile. Now, back in the central part of the country, there is growing discontent as well. People feeling that their wages don't keep up with inflation, that their working conditions are miserable. And workers in the central part of the country, working in the large urban areas, in the ports, etc., uh, turn to anarchism. Many of them become followers of anarchist political movements. Finally, there is a growing middle class, something that largely hadn't existed before, uh, of white-collar employees. And these people, too, feel as though this parliamentary system that they have does little to reward them. There is no social safety net. There's no social security. The educational system is miserable, meaning most of their children won't be able to get a decent education. And many of these people begin turning towards ideas of socialism in the 1920s and early 1930s, looking for an alternative to the kind of system that exists in their country up until this time. So we have segments of all of these groups, workers in the north, workers in the central part of the country, middle class people turning towards more radical doctrines such as communism, anarchism, socialism, and all of them highly critical of both their own elite and also of the British, feeling that their elite has aligned itself with the British to exploit them and exploit their country and leave them in desperate circumstances. Hmm. Now, into this rather tense relationship between the elite, other elements of society, and British investors, step the Americans. In the personages of the Guggenheim brothers. The Guggenheim brothers had developed in the United States in the latter part of the 19th century one of the largest mining empires in the world. They had been famous for developing mines in Leadville, Colorado, in Utah. They had begun expanding into Mexico. And now, by 1910, they had come to Chile looking to invest in Chile's copper industry. The copper industry by this time was in a moribund state. It had never recovered from the decline that occurred in the 1870s. It was inefficient and couldn't seriously compete with most of the copper mines operating elsewhere in the world at this time. So the Guggenheims see an opportunity. And they seize it by buying what constituted a mountain of copper ore, a place called Chukicamata, up in the northern desert regions where the nitrate refineries are. This mountain of ore had largely gone, gone ignored over the years because it was low-grade copper. In other words, only a small percentage of copper contained in the ore itself. But the Guggenheims had developed new processes which could extract this copper and do it at very low cost. As a result, the Guggenheims turned Chukikumata into the largest mine in the world, largest open pit mine in the world. It's a huge mine dug by steam shovels with huge trucks carrying the material out to large refineries, which break down the copper and export it at a highly profitable price. So the Guggenheims come to dominate the Chilean copper industry early in the 20th century. And having done that, uh, they begin to turn their eye towards the nitrate industry. The nitrate industry is suffering, of course, its own decline. It's inefficient. Again, because labor is cheap, the British investors haven't improved the technology in nitrate refining in more than 40 years. 
and it occurs to the Guggenheims if they take basically the same technology they're using in copper and adapt it to nitrates, they can make a fortune. Because now they can dramatically lower the cost of extracting nitrate in Chile, and they can compete readily with the synthetic producers in the world. So this becomes their goal, to take many of their resources that are in copper, switch over to nitrates, and make a fortune. And in 1927, that's exactly what the Guggenheims do. They sell off Chukikamata and buy into the nitrate industry. Now, as the Guggenheims are making their way in the economic world in Chile, politics in Chile is becoming increasingly unstable. As you can imagine, with the nitrate industry going into decline, and that is the principal source of wealth in the country at this time, with the increasing discontent of workers and middle class people, there is bound to be a political reaction. In 1920, a member of the elite who was promising reform named Arturo Alessandre was elected president, promising that he would break the deadlock that seemed to have persisted for years during the parliamentary period when the government was getting very little done, when there was little response to the needs of workers or middle class people. But Alessandre, in his first few years as president, finds himself frustrated and his plans frustrated because, of course, the traditional elite, those who benefit from the old system, still control Congress. Finally, he is removed from office by the military, who feel that they must go in and break this political deadlock. And one of the leading officers, a man named Carlos Ibanez, uh, essentially imposes himself as president from 1927 to 1931. So this military officer has now taken charge. The old system has been set aside, and Ibanez will rule effectively as a dictator. There is a Congress, etc., but he has enormous authority, and of course nobody really wants to cross him since he has the backing of the military. Now, Ibanez realizes that Chile is in desperate economic straits. Yes, the copper industry is growing, but it's only a fraction of what the nitrate industry brought in to the country in the past, at least up until now. The nitrate industry is in steady decline. Something has to be done to revive the economy. Ibanez's solution is to form a partnership with the Guggenheims. The Guggenheims know that if they're really going to dominate nitrates and be as efficient as they plan to be, they have to control the whole nitrate region. That includes government-owned properties and more than 100 refineries owned by Europeans and others. With the government's backing, they can gain control of all of that land, the entire nitrate industry. So they'll form a partnership with Ibanez, a joint Guggenheim government corporation called COSACH, which simply translated as the Chilean Nitrate Company. So this will be a joint venture between American investors and the Chilean government. And it is hoped that the new efficiency of the nitrate industry under the Guggenheims will salvage the industry and also salvage Chile's economy. However, there's bad news for both Ibanez and the Guggenheims. All of this they're sorting out in 1928, 1929. They launch their venture, COSACH, and the next thing that happens, of course, is the Great Depression strikes. Suddenly financing from New York, and this project requires hundreds of millions of dollars in financing, financing from New York isn't going to be possible because New York banks don't have money to lend. Furthermore, the price of nitrate for everyone is just plummeting because of the Great Depression. So suddenly the COSACH scheme, which seems so promising, is falling apart and Chile's economy is continuing to plummet. And it is that which leads to the overthrow of Ibanez in 1931, as popular protests mount both against the desperate economic conditions of the Depression, but also against the government for aligning itself with the Americans. Now, instead of the British, it's the Americans who try and say, well, look, we wouldn't be having all these problems if the Americans hadn't come in and did what they have done, if we control these industries directly, like nitrates and copper, then our country would get more of the income. 
debris being sold down the river by people like Ibanez cooperating with these foreigners, the Americans. After the overthrow of Ibanez, there's a brief period of socialist government, a few weeks, called the Socialist Republic, indicative of the fact that people were looking for radical change. It does not survive very long. There is considerable political turbulence, as you can imagine, during the 1930s as the problems of the Depression persist. But out of this emerges a new government, a center-left coalition called the Popular Front. It included parties from the center, middle class parties, if you will, and from the left, such as the Socialist Party, the Communists. This coalition is able to elect a president. And clearly there is a shift in terms of politics and political participation in Chile. Clearly, middle class and at least organized workers are getting more of a say in the political system that they had than they had in the past. Another element in this new political order are a series of organizations called gremios. A gremio is a professional association. In this country, you'd think of the American Bar Association, the American Medical Association, the National Manufacturers Association. In other words, professional associations. In Chile, there was a National Manufacturers Association, a National Mine Owners Association, a National Chamber of Commerce. These professional associations are what are known as gremios. Their significance is this, that in our country, such groups normally function as lobbying agencies. In other words, they go to Congress and they try to get congressmen to vote in favor of legislation that they support. But in Chile, the gremios actually had a direct line into the government itself. For example, there's a central bank, which operates like Federal Reserve. Representatives of the gremios sit on the board of the central bank. There is a national planning association for the economy. Representatives of the gremios sit on that board as well. So these people don't have to lobby. They're actually part of the decision-making process in government. What's happened is that because the elite no longer has a total monopoly over political power, because some of that power now has to be shared with at least some urban elements, the elite is being given another way to have a direct say in the government, and that is through these professional associations. As for the military, the military by now, which I mean by the late 1930s, has adopted what it calls a constitutionalist perspective. In other words, the official position of the military in Chile is that the military does not interfere in political affairs. After the experience of Ibanez's dictatorship, which didn't turn out all that well, the military says that, well, we will not interfere in politics unless there is a violation of the Constitution. Okay? Someone would have to violate the Constitution for us to actually interfere in domestic politics. And this remains the basic philosophy of the military over the next several decades. Now, underlying this new political arrangement in which the elite has given up some political authority, they don't control the presidency at this point, uh, but they've been given another direct line into political power through the gremios and their position. Underlying all of this, because the elite had to agree to allow greater participation in the political system, I mean, somehow they had to agree to this, underlying this arrangement is a compromise, a historic compromise. It's an unwritten compromise. Nobody sat down and wrote this down, per se. But the compromise is this, that if political parties representing the middle class and working class people, parties of the center and the left, if they want to have more political control, OK, they can have some more political control. But in return, 
they must agree not to tamper with conditions in the countryside. That means they are not to go out and organize peasants. They are not to try to recruit peasants to vote for their positions. They are not to organize peasants so that they can strike for higher wages or demand land, etc. They are to leave the countryside alone. And then if they want to do things like set up a social security system, which they do, etc., okay, fine, they can do that. But they leave the countryside alone for several reasons. One, because the elite controls the votes of peasants. If you're a peasant working on an estate and it's election day, the landowner or his manager comes and puts you all on a truck and drives you down to the election site and they hand you a ballot and they tell you who you're to market for and it's not a secret ballot. You stand there and mark it and throw it in the box and you vote for whoever the landowner tells you to vote for. So peasants are an important source of electoral strength for the elite. They want that left alone. And secondly, of course, peasants are cheap labor. So they're an important part of the economic support for the elite. So this is the deal. Center and left political parties will leave the countryside alone. In return, they can have a greater share in the political process. Now, with the onset of World War II, Chile's economy starts to recover. The world economy is getting better. And Chile begins to try to industrialize, to move beyond its dependence on things like copper, particularly now that's the major export of the country. Nitrates are still there, but not nearly as important as they used to be. Agricultural products. But to get beyond that and industrialize. The government sets up a development corporation called CORFO, and that's what it stood for, the Development Corporation. It would be a government agency that would help encourage industrialization. It might actually start certain industries. It would help private investors start industries. The state would take a role in promoting industrialization. The policy that was going to make this happen was called import substituting industrialization. The government would raise tariffs on imported goods, especially consumer goods, and use those revenues to help develop industries, industries that would now be protected by those high import duties. In the past, Chile had low import duties and exported copper, nitrates, wheat, whatever, and bought relatively inexpensive industrial goods in Britain or the United States. I should say consumer goods. Now they're going to exclude those goods to a great degree and try to manufacture them at home under this policy. Chile enjoys considerable economic growth during the 1940s and into the beginning of the 1950s. But by 1952-53, it is clear serious problems are arising. Two in particular. One, economic growth is slowing down. And second, inflation is rising. What in this country was called in the 1970s, stagflation. Yep relative economic stagnation, the economy is not growing at all, or growing very slowly, and yet inflation is rising at the same time. Two very bad things to have happened at the same time, because usually inflation is related to economic growth. Those problems begin to undermine the economy and, again, support for the political system. Those problems stemmed in no small measure from this historic compromise that had been reached in the 1930s. Economically, there were two basic problems with the historic compromise, both relating to peasants. One, if peasants weren't going to be organized, if they were going to be left as they were, there was really no motivation for landowners to become more efficient, to produce more food. And as a result, Chile was unable to feed itself, even though Chile has some of the most fertile land and some of the best uh, environmental conditions in the world for food production. It couldn't feed itself because agriculture was so inefficient. And as a result, the government is spending more and more money to import food, spending more than it has, deficit spending, and that's contributing to inflation. So inefficient agriculture 
contributes to inflation. Inefficient agriculture also means prices are high for basic agricultural goods, and that means it's difficult to get industries started because workers don't have enough money to pay for food. The other major problem with this is that peasants are over half the population of the country. And if you're starting industries designed to feed a consumer market, and that's what most industries were designed to do, half the population isn't even in the consumer market because over half the population is at a subsistence level. So if peasants aren't doing better, half the population of the country isn't doing better, half the population of the country doesn't even provide a market for the growth of consumer industries. So the historic compromise, which helped the political factions reach a compromise in terms of sharing some power between the elite and middle and working classes is causing serious economic problems because of the condition of the peasantry contributing to inflation and putting a damper on industrialization. Meanwhile, there is a political stalemate. The country is basically divided between center, left, and right. In other words, you get parties on the left, parties in the center, parties on the right, and each of them can garner about a third of the vote in an election. But that means nobody's really getting control of the situation. Now, there's not one party that can say, okay, or one group of parties, we're on the left, we're on the right, we're in the center, and we're in charge here because we have a majority of the vote. You have political deadlock. As a result of this, the center and the left parties begin undermining the historic compromise. They're going to go out and start politically organizing peasants, trying to get them to vote for the center or left political parties. So gradually, the historic compromise is coming unstuck. As this is going on, during the 50s and 60s, the voting public is looking for solutions. They know inflation is high, economic growth is low, unemployment is high, they've got serious problems. And over a series of presidential elections, the electorate in Chile will essentially move from the right to the center to the left looking for a solution. They'll elect a rightist president, try him, that doesn't work, try somebody in the middle, that doesn't work, and finally they'll move to the left and elect the leftist president in trying to solve their problems. The first, the rightist, the conservative, was Jorge Alessandri. His father was the one who was elected in 1920. Jorge, his son, is elected in 1958. Uh, Jorge Alessandri was a uh, conservative businessman, represented the Nationalist Party, which is one of the leading conservative parties in the country at this time, and he will try traditional conservative approaches uh, to getting the economy going and solving inflation, cutting back government spending, etc. Uh, in the end, by 1964, it's clear that hasn't worked. So the electorate goes a little bit more to the left and looks towards a center politician and movement a uh, man named Eduardo Frey. Frey was the head of a new political party called the Christian Democrats. The Christian Democrats particularly appealed to the middle class, although they, they were trying to organize peasants and to some degree trying to appeal to workers as well. Uh, they were looking towards sort of technocratic solutions. Uh, they would bring in economists, there would be more government planning, efforts to stimulate industrialization, land reform in the hope that turning land over to peasants would actually make agriculture more efficient. Uh, but all of this would be done to a limited extent. They didn't want to go to great extremes. By the end of Frey's six-year administration, unemployment is again in the 20 to 25 percent range Inflation has been creeping up for three years, and things don't look too good. And so now, in the third effort, in the presidential election of 1970, the electorate chooses Salvador Allende, a socialist, as president. 
And of course, Allende is going to come in with a more radical set of proposals. He wants to nationalize large industries, including the American copper industry. Copper industry is controlled 90% by Americans. Uh, he wants to vastly accelerate land reform, redistributing land to peasants, wants to redistribute income towards the lower half of the population. So he has some very radical proposals that he wants to carry out as president. The political coalition that backed the end, it was called Popular Unity. And it was consisted of a number of political parties, but particularly the Communists and the Socialists. They were the two main political parties. So this is clearly a leftist coalition. The Socialists and the Communists are the two primary components, and then a number of smaller parties. And popular unity, led by Allende, will carry through on his proposals. One of the first things that Allende does is order the nationalization of the U.S. copper industry. Now, it should be noted that his government did not have a majority in Congress, but this measure passed unanimously in Congress. Even though the center and right-wing parties have a majority there, they all vote for it, too, because by now, most Chileans are convinced that one of the major problems for the country is that its largest resource uh, is controlled by foreigners and that they manage to extract most of the wealth from that and that Chile does not get nearly enough from that. So the U.S. copper industry is nationalized. He also proceeds to expropriate and nationalize an array of other large companies, both domestic and foreign. Bank of America, National Cash Register Corporation, uh, ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph, uh, which was the leading phone company in Chile at this time, a U.S.-owned multinational. All of these are taken over by the government. In addition, he rapidly accelerates the land reform process. Only about 40,000 peasants got land under Frey. Now hundreds of thousands of people are going to get land. Finally, he institutes income redistribution. Chile, for decades, had suffered from serious inflation, and the government had an annual readjustment of salaries, where all people earning wages or salaries in the country would have those adjusted for inflation. Not just people working in the government, but whatever sector you're in, if you were earning wages. How much you got, how big the adjustment was, varied usually from year to year, how much the government felt it could afford. What Allende starts doing is giving the biggest adjustments to people at the bottom half of the income scale, and the lesser increases to people at the top. You know, if inflation is 20% this year, maybe we're going to give 20% to the people at the bottom, but only 5% to the highest salary earners. So there's going to be, essentially, a redistribution of income in the direction of people at the lower half of the income scale. All of this is a fairly radical set of policies designed to get the economy moving. The Allende government believes that by controlling about a third of the economy, they haven't nationalized the whole economy, or they haven't expropriated everything, but some of the largest companies, by controlling that largest third, and by redistributing land and redistributing incomes, they can stimulate production in the country. More people will have access to the moneyed economy, will be in the market to buy things, and they can, of course, build upon that to expand economic growth by expanding economic access to the lower half of the population. And, of course, along the way, they expect to win more political support from people who benefit from these measures. And they institute along the way social policies to expand educational opportunities, uh, to expand the availability of health care uh, to the poorer population. Uh, these kinds of measures are designed, again, to benefit the lower half of the population in particular and also to build political support. But not surprisingly, such a radical set of measures also set off intense political conflict in the country. Allende is convinced that 
he can achieve these changes through what he calls the Chilean way. He's an old, experienced politician. He'd been president of the Chilean Senate. He'd been a cabinet minister. And he has a firm belief that Chile has, and it did have, this long history of constitutional government. And he believed that those constitutional institutions would survive uh, even though he was carrying out radical changes and that in the end, uh, Chile's political system would survive radical change and he'd be able to accomplish his goals uh, without stirring a violent reaction in society. But that was not to be the case. Increasingly, political conflict intensifies. And then in October of 1972, a strike occurs in the country called a paro, Spanish term for strike, or stoppage. The strike is not by workers. It's by the gremios, by those professional associations, National Manufacturers Association, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Truck, Drive, no, Truck Owners Association. There's a huge trucking system in the country. Truck owners are shutting down. The professional associations, doctors were going to go on strike would not see patients at hospitals. Lawyers went on strike, but nobody really noticed. Um, things kept functioning normally without them. Now, this is a strike by some of the key groups in the economy, those at the top of the economic pyramid. And it really brings the country's economy to a screeching halt, even though the government is out uh, using workers to transport food and open stores, etc. Nevertheless, it has a devastating impact on the national economy, and indeed, the whole country is seized by a sense of crisis as the strike drags on from October into November of 1972. There are ongoing discussions between Allende and the Popular Unity, his backers, and the opposition particularly the Christian Democrats and the National Party. The Christian Democrats, of course, would represent the centrist group, and the National Party, the principal conservative or right-wing political group. Finally, a compromise is reached to end the strike in November of 1972. This compromise is based on the following agreement. There are congressional elections scheduled for March of 1973. So we're talking about four months into the future. There are going to be con national congressional elections. The opposition says, we will agree to bring the strike to an end if you bring the leaders of the various military services into your cabinet, particularly the position of Minister of the Interior. Minister of the Interior is the next most important government job to the presidency. There is no vice president in Chile. There is no position known as vice president. The next most important job is Minister of the Interior. The Minister of the Interior is responsible for internal security of the country. And furthermore, if the president leaves the country or is somehow for some reason unable to fill his duties, the Minister of the Interior carries out those duties of the President. Furthermore, the Minister of the Interior is responsible for supervising elections. So, if a military officer is in charge of the Ministry of the Interior, the military will actually be responsible for supervising the elections. The opposition says, look, we don't trust you. We think you'll try to manipulate the election. So we want the military in there as a guarantee that these elections will be fair and honest and we'll have a chance uh, to, in fact, get our people elected in Congress. Now, the man who is the key to this compromise is the commander of the Army and commander of the Armed Forces, General Carlos Prats. And Prats is to be installed as the Minister of the Interior. So he's going to play the central role in carrying out the elections in March of 1973. Now, the opposition has 
more than just, okay, we'll run an election and we'll be happy in mind. They are forming an electoral alliance, particularly the Christian Democrats, the center party, and the national party, the main right-wing party. They are forming what they call a democratic alliance for the March elections. What that means is this, that in each congressional district, there will be at least three candidates running at a minimum. Usually one candidate from the National Party, a candidate from the Christian Democratic Party, and then a candidate from the Pop to Unity, the coalition backing it. There may be others, but those will be the three major ones. Now, in this situation, as the opposition sees it, they're splitting their votes because they're both desirous of stopping the government, but in each congressional district, they'll be running against each other as well as against the government. So what they are going to do under this democratic alliance that they form is that they are going to go to each congressional district and say, all right, who has the best chance of being elected here, the Christian Democrat or the National Party candidate? If it's the Christian Democrat, fine, then the National Party candidate will drop out. If it's a National Party candidate, then the Christian Democratic candidate will drop out. And we will instruct our followers, our supporters, to vote for that other person. If it's the Christian Democrat, then the National Party will ask its voters to vote for the Christian Democrat. That way we will maximize our strength. We will elect the maximum number of representatives because we won't be splitting our strength. We won't be running against each other, but only against the government. Now, the key to all of this is that under the Constitution, the president can be impeached with a two-thirds majority of Congress. So Allende could effectively be removed as president if two-thirds of the Congress vote to remove him. At this point, the opposition, again, mostly the Christian Democrats and the National Party, have a slight majority in each of the two houses. The House of Deputies, which the House of Representatives, we would call it in this country, and the Senate. So they have a little over a majority, a little over 50%. But they have to get up essentially to 66%, two-thirds of the Congress. So this strategy of merging their votes is designed specifically to get them a two-thirds majority in the Congress and then use that to remove Allende. And that would be a constitutional measure. Congressional elections come, take place in March of 1973. The end result? Well, the opposition wins more seats in one house and loses more seats in the other. They have no more control, in fact, less control after the March election than they had before. So the idea of ousting Allende through a vote in Congress is out of the question. That's simply not going to happen. Carlos Pratz and the other military officers who have been members of the cabinet, of course, will now step down again. Members of the Popular Unity, the political coalition, will take over once more. Events become increasingly violent in Chile after the March elections of 1973. There are a series of political assassinations that occur in the months after the election, something that was extremely rare in Chilean politics, the actual assassination of individuals involved in the political process. In June of 1973, there is an attempted coup by a tank battalion stationed outside the capital that rolls into the Capitol one morning, tries to seize the presidential palace. General Pratt, who is a constitutionalist and believes that the government has not violated the Constitution, dispatches his troops and puts down the insurrection. But there has been an attempt 
by a military unit to overthrow the government in June of 1973. And it is learned that that leader of that unit has ties to an extreme right-wing political group called Patria y Libertad, which means fatherland and liberty. In fact, they had a logo that looked suspiciously like a swastika, uh, which was kind of representative of their political views. But we clearly have an extremist political group and at least a faction of the military that have been involved in plotting against the government at this point, and they have attempted to overthrow the government. After that incident in June of 1973, after the attempted coup, there was increasing attacks on Pratt's. They had actually been mounting uh, ever since the March election. But these grow in intensity after he suppresses the attempted coup in March of 1973. Uh, conservative newspapers are highly critical of Pratt, saying that he failed his responsibility, that uh, he has not lived up to his obligations as head of the armed forces, uh, that the government has, in fact, acted unconstitutionally, and uh, he is suppressing liberty by his continuing support of this regime. There is also growing unrest within the military, criticism of Pratt's growing within the military over his position as well. Now, he is very insistent that he does not support the government. He's not a government supporter. His position is, I'm a constitutionalist. Unless you can show me that this government has, in fact, violated the Constitution, my obligation as a military officer is to maintain this government in power against attempts to remove it unconstitutionally. However, with the growing pressure within the military against him, Pratt finally feels that he must resign. And in August of 1973, he steps down from his position and retires from the military. Now, there is the question of replacing Pratt's and who should be put in his place. The Allende government has been very conscious of its relationships with the military. The military, of course, has had this long history of being constitutionalist, that it doesn't interfere with the activities of a constitutional government. And therefore, the NA regime has been uh, very careful to make sure that the promotion process works as it normally does. In other words, uh, seniority counts, and uh, there's a review by military officers of this. They have kept up the military's budget, so they won't be getting angry at the government. And here, with this critical post as commander of the armed forces, or the uh, head of the armed forces, uh, they again allow the normal promotion procedures to complete themselves. And the successor to Carlos Prats is a man named Augusto Pinochet. General Pinochet uh, was a longtime military officer, was believed to be apolitical that he was really not involved in politics. Uh, many political offices had political persuasions or connections with one party or another. Uh, it was believed that he was an apolitical, uh, professional military man. Uh, and besides which, again, since he was next in line for that position, the, and the administrators felt that that's what uh, they should do. In fact, unbeknownst to them, uh, Pinochet had, in fact, been plotting for some time to overthrow the government. He had been looking for an opportunity. He had been organizing secret meetings among a few key officers in the various branches of the military. Uh, and he had long been plotting. Now, with Pratt's removed from his position as head of the armed forces and Pinochet in that position instead, it was only a matter of a few weeks uh, before Pinochet was able to carry through his plan. On the night of September 10th, 1973, units under Pinochet's command spread out through the country and arrest hundreds of military officers who are suspected of either being loyal to the government, supporters of the government, or who are considered to be constitutionalists who would object to any coup that would replace the government unconstitutionally. 
On the morning of September 11th, the military moves in to occupy the capital and other key locations. Allende, who is at home when first news arrives of the coup taking place, rushes to the presidential palace. And the presidential palace now comes under intense fire from the military. Sometime during the course of the day, Allende dies, hmm? whether by his own hand or at the hands of the military, has never been entirely clear. He may have killed himself, realizing that his administration, his presidency was coming to an end and, in fact, was being destroyed. Pinochet now takes over as the president of Chile. He bans all other political parties. All political parties are going into recess. There will be no Congress. Military men will be put in charge of all of the major administrative units of government, all the way down to municipalities, and even universities will find military officers being sent in as interventors to run them. There will be a general purge of anyone suspected of the wrong political leanings. And I think, well, in other words, anyone who is center or left will be removed. Thousands of people will disappear, murdered by the military, and tens of thousands more will be placed in prisons and concentration camps uh, over the succeeding years. Uh, Chile will be subjected to a harsh military dictatorship that will extend for more than 15 years after the coup in September of 1973. Now, this is the basic story of what happened in Chile in terms of historic background and the events of the early 1970s. As far as the historical crisis, the basic crisis that we can trace through Chile's history is that starting really in the 19th century and moving forward, there are these constant efforts to redivide the wealth of the country. In 1891, Civil War, which ends in another president's suicide, the battle is among elements of the elite, Congress versus the president. You know, who's going to control the sharing up of the nitrate wealth? Well, as a result of the Civil War, it's going to be the elite in Congress who are going to decide that. In the decades that follow, as organized labor and the middle class emerge, there is increasing pressure by them to try to gain a share of society's resources, better education, better wages, etc. And some of that is accomplished uh, under the popular front. They gain some degree of access, although unorganized workers benefit little, if at all, uh, from this change. But at least organized, unionized workers and the middle class gain some political access and some benefits. Social security system, for example, set up education gets somewhat better, at least for the urban middle class. But that the historic compromise that brings these groups together and brings them some share of power also means the peasantry, over half the population, is excluded under this compromise. But by the late 50s and early 60s, the center-left parties are starting to reach out to the peasants. And then, with Allende's election in 1970, he makes a radical transformation as he radically advances the process of agrarian reform and redistributing land from the elite and handing it over to peasants. He also makes dramatic changes with redistribution of income and with his nationalization of U.S. interests. Those efforts to expand the population that shares in the resources of the country divides the society into a bitter conflict over this last effort to expand access to wealth in Chilean society. It is that which divides the country and creates the crisis that emerges in the early 1970s, a crisis that is finally brought to a dramatic end with the military intervention in September of 1973. That's the historic crisis. 
And those are the domestic developments that denoted that crisis and finally brought it to an end in September of 73. All of this, of course, leaves out one key factor, the CIA. We've told the story, and it is an accurate story. Everything I've told you is accurate, factually correct. The one part I've left out is, what about the CIA? What were they doing in all of this? Where are the Americans? When we come back for the second half, I'm going to tell you pretty much the same story, though it's going to concentrate on contemporary or the contemporary events of the 1970s, 60s and 70s, but a new version, a version that says, okay, now we're going to pull the curtain aside and see what's going on over here. What part is the CIA playing in all of this? To what extent are these events simply the inevitable product of conflicts within the society, and to what extent did the United States and the CIA play a role in bringing about this collapse of democracy in Chile in 1973? We'll come back and look at that in a few minutes. <laughs>